first live event on Zoom. So also welcome to our online uh, audiences, um, to the third, uh, to the public program, The Fortress of Crossed Destinies, curated by Marina Fukides, and the third event, The Crossing Number Three, The Chariot, entitled Europe, The Fortress of Crossed War Wars. And I would like to welcome online Marina Fukides, who will give an introduction, and Vasil Charapanin, who came here the day before yesterday, arrived from Kiev uh, in Salzburg. And uh, before I will hand over the word to Marina Fukides, I would like to introduce both Marina and Vasil shortly. So, uh, Vasil is uh, the head of the Visual Cultural Research Center, an institution founded in Kiev in 2008 as a platform for collaboration among ac academic, artistic, and activist communities. The VCRC received the European Cultural Foundation Princess Margaret Award for Culture in 2015 and the Igor Sabel Award uh, Crown for Culture and Theory in 2018. Sherapanin is also a co-organizer of the Kiev Biennial. Welcome, Vasil, and welcome, Marina. Marina is a long-term collaborator of the Academy. Um, uh, she is a curator and writer based in Athens, where she is now joining us from. Um, in 2014, she was appointed the head of artistic office in Athens and cultural advisor for Documenta 14. She's the founder of Kunsthalle Athens and the founding director and editor-in-chief of South as a State of Mind, an arts and cultural magazine. Welcome, Marina. So Marina will give us a short introduction to the program she has curated, the title, and also to the talk of Vasil. It's your, the floor is yours. Hi. Hello, and uh, very nice to see you. Thank you so much, Sophie, for this introduction, for hosting the program, for working in the program together with um, us. And thank you, Vasil, uh, so much for being with us, leaving uh, momentarily your home under extreme threat in order to exchange with us whatever can be or cannot be exchanged. Um, as Sophie said, this is the third uh, event of um, the public program, The Fortress of Cross Destinies, which borrows a title from, its title from a 1973 book by Italo Calvino, The Castle of Cross Destinies, in which a group of travelers meet by chance in the castle, in the, in the heart of the forest, but are not able to speak to each other, uh, to exchange stories with each other in the one go. They manage this only through being with each other and through a pack of tarot cards that they throw for, that the narrator throw, throw for each of them. Now, this tale of uh, Italo Calvino uh, constitutes in a way um, a valid parable upon which to make a public program of encounter as part of an international summer academy which is located in a um, historical town in Europe, in his historical fortress in Europe, amidst mountains and valleys, amidst uh, empires and conflicts and wars, and et cetera, et cetera. And here we find ourselves, actually me from far away, but never mind, um, as guests in a castle of, um, like the guests in the castle of Calvino, under a cloud of somehow a sense of mutual untranslatability. Not because we don't know each other from before, which is the case, but not uh, in every case, but also um, due to a kind of a progression of history that runs faster than we could ever imagine. And in the meantime, finds us taking our own eyes and the eyes of each other with our own bare hands. Um, like the opening of the novel, we find ourselves uh, in a kind of a way muted by continuous hazards, um, such as the everlasting processes of colonialism, a series of worldwide economic crises, the omen of the environmental crisis, the pandemic, the persistent violence in an all private and public uh, life, the successful deadly wars as we speak. And these are the times to maybe learn or unlearn or come together in fictive castles, as in Italo Calvino 70s books, or in um, real experimental academies like the one you find and we find ourselves in, 
to reflect on new possibilities of transformation or not transformation and of our cross or no cross destinies. We are honored to have Vasily Cherepanin uh, tonight with us. And I wanted just to give a small uh, and brief um, like story where we somehow met with Vasil, which was on a digital platform of Documenta 14, which started in 2017 as Documenta 14 ended and continues up to now. Uh, not so far, um, not so far uh, away in the past, in October uh, 2021, Vasil shared the news of an international um, institutional alliance between Eastern European Biennals to form the 2021 Kyiv Biennial, uh, this edition. This was an excellent paradigm of, for new forms of international solidarity and alternative cultural solution to overcome any kind of issues that they were, um, and, and troubles that they were back then in the foreground. By the way, can you see me? Because I lost the sign with the, the academy. I guess you can, right, that's fine. So um, speaking of this international Kyiv uh, biennial, the next message we had after that caught our attention and this time froze our blood in the same uh, platform after the October 21, it was on February 26, 22, when Vasil was writing. Please do everything possible wherever you are. Stop this disaster. Make actions, not wor words. We don't have another chance. Please, everything possible. Act now. We live in bomb, bomb shelters. The whole country is under attack. Denazify Putin. This was five months ago. And nothing much on that sort have happened. But the news uh, on that uh, terms is for Vasil to share. The questions, though, remains the same. How can we reimagine the European institutional order, as Vasil put it? Can we arrive again, if ever, at the formation of new old vocabularies that encompass a risk, but also promise new forms of solidarity and interconnectedness? Can we? I don't know. Um, up to Vasil now. Thank you so much. And um, good night from my part from Athens. Uh, <laughs> I, I hope you, you hear me well, right? Uh, yeah. Thank you so much, um, first of all, to all of you for uh, kindly coming uh, tonight for, for this talk. It's my great pleasure uh, to be uh, with you uh, today. And first of all, I would like to express my indeed deep uh, thankfulness to uh, Marina Fokidis uh, for her kind introduction and for having me here and also especially to uh, Sophie uh, Goltz uh, for, uh, for this uh, invitation. Personally, it's a really a great honor uh, for me to be part of the Salzburg uh, International uh, Summer School of uh, Fine Arts, uh, especially being uh, part of this uh, great uh, installation. Um, because, uh, as we all know, uh, camouflage uh, patterns are intended uh, uh, to hide something, right, to cover up, uh, which is uh, both a typical military task as well as the, the, um, the purpose of uh, the dominant ideology. Whereas, uh, as I assume, the idea behind the school of seeing which is behind the uh, Summer Academy um, uh, idea and uh, conduct, is quite the opposite, which is rather on the side of the critique of ideology, to reveal what is hidden, to make the invisible visible. So I hope that my talk will contribute to this um, endeavor. Uh, and like, especially with regards to what Marina was saying, that history has been approaching us faster than we uh, imagined uh, before. But also politically speaking, I, I perceive this invitation as a genuine solidarity gesture, which I really appreciate very, very much because it's so much needed today. So uh, uh, thank you so much again um, uh, for that. I'm sorry that I'm standing backwards. Yeah. Um, and also, before we start, I would like to express my thankfulness uh, to the Ukrainian military 
uh, without which uh, I just wouldn't be able to be here, obviously, uh, and to come, and without which uh, my country wouldn't, wouldn't exist, at least in the form it does uh, exist uh, at the moment, and without which you here in the EU, I'm sure, would be busy with totally different agenda than what uh, we are going to discuss uh, today in particular. Um, as I am coming from, uh, from the country uh, which is experiencing uh, occupation, annexation, uh, filtration camps, deportation, and these are not metaphors, though the lexicon itself sounds like a kind of a ghost one, right? Coming from the past, this history that is approaching us. At the same time, these are the, the actual realities on the ground and the very awareness of these realities uh, kind of provides uh, some, um, at least for me, uh, some fidelity to, truth, to the truth that I'm trying to follow. Uh, and uh, that, uh, in a way, allows me to speak to you on the matter uh, today. That is also my political task. Right, as a Ukrainian, as well as as a European and a citizen. So um, I decided to uh, entitle this talk uh, "Europe: The Fortress of Crossed Wars," in line of the uh, the concept that Marina suggested for the uh, public program as such, uh, the fortress of uh, cross destinies. So I basically took the same metaphor, right? just applied it to the current political developments uh, with regards to Europe, um, whose uh, destiny or fate uh, depends again uh, on, the, on the war. And uh, at the same time, we uh, at least, uh, I'm, I'm speaking, <laughs> it's also perhaps uh, worth no, uh, mentioning that I, I will be and am uh, speaking from the other side of the European wall. Right. Uh, not really the same, so we somehow share the same space, but at the same time it's, it's not really true. Uh, so uh, from, a, from this point of view, from, from, from the Ukrainian perspective, uh, the, the so-called United Europe, or whatever you call it, uh, still behaves as, this, as if uh, this war is uh, somebody else's war. And there are uh, many, many reasons for that. Uh, so I will try to make a couple of points uh, as a um, kind of a pro proposition for, for the discussion, also for tomorrow, because from, from 2 p.m. till 6, right, we will have a kind of a workshop or a general, more general discussion. So I'm here rather not to, uh, first of all, to learn, right, we're very interested to hear your feedback and uh, your experiences and your perceptions with regards to what is happening uh, um, a bit outside the, uh, the, the EU. Uh, so, uh, the, the, uh, the, the reason why I think that, uh, well, it's perhaps pretty obvious that uh, the, the, the United Europe, uh, the European Union, uh, the West in general, so-called Collective West, uh, behaves uh, today like that. Uh, is very much um, kind of shaped uh, and um, defined by the uh, also by political, historical, and uh, of course ideological uh, reasons. So first of all, um, I think the problem in this regard, uh, uh, as we, when we talk about the fortress, uh, the, you, uh, about Europe as a fortress, is uh, lies in the. Um, what I would call a kind of a modus operandi of the United Europe, right, which you can also trace elsewhere. The problem here is that the, uh, the dominant type of uh, the EU governance or governmentality uh, today is basically uh, that I'm sure like, all of us have experienced, is uh, very much about externalizing problems, antagonisms, conflicts, to the outside, which is very much about bordering conflicts, right? Pushing them to the outside in order to keep the interior safe. 
And uh, as a result of this, uh, th that's basically a strategy of a, a typical gated community strategy, right? And as a result of this strategy of not solving conflicts, but rather bothering them, pushing to the peripheries, so-called, quote-unquote, peripheries, and accusing peripheries uh, for that, uh, as a result of this, the EU uh, is basically surrounded by a belt of wars in its south and its east, Ukraine and uh, Syria um, uh, included which unavoidably is being accompanied by a huge influxes of migrants and escapers from, uh, from warfare. And this is very much connected also to a kind of a political lifestyle of, of Europe, right? That uh, somehow uh, something which is uh, here as far as I can see, because again, my perspective is a bit an, an outside one, a uh, kind of a natural uh, state of things, right? A kind of like an, the, the air you breathe here, a clean air. Um, that uh, whenever, and this political lifestyle is based on the assumption that whenever, um, uh, you, you, can, you may take any European country you want, right? But uh, whenever the, 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 the EU is facing some uh, ideological polarization or discontent, fear, or anger. So those really strong emotions which, which profoundly define our lives. Uh, a typical strategy in this case is uh, to go back to the norm, to kind of business as usual, right? To some neutrality, to consensus that can save us from, from those extremes. This strategy is pretty popular also in terms of elections, right? Also re pretty recent ones. Consider Macron and so on. So all in all, this idea is, be, is actually focused on being a kind of um, centrist no normality, uh, and neutrality, a kind of a self-satisfied bubble, uh, which provides some illusionary protections from those extremes, from being disturbed uh, it's a kind of a sanctuary, so pretty often Europe indeed is functioning as a sanctuary from the unbearable, which is always taking place elsewhere, not here, somewhere else. A kind of an Elysium, right? And uh, by the way, this is exactly the precise reason why the EU has been haunted by right-wing populism for years and for sure will be <laughs> continuously, right? And. Um, this also, like, if you go back a bit to the, uh, to the uh, realities of the war, uh, this uh, so-called so neutrality from the West or from the side of, of Europe also defines today a pretty typic typical approach, which I personally also encountered many times during recent months, uh, but also before, um, from the side, not only from the side of the Western media, but also from the cultural field in Europe and elsewhere in the West. Uh, which is also kind of a, some idea of um, protection from, uh, from affective truth, uh, from, uh, from those Ukrainian voices at war, which are, uh, which are full of uh, fury, pain, uh, rage, or anger. Uh, so as if, uh, as if, uh, the full expression of such really very strong uh, and uh, maybe sometimes destructive emotions uh, deprives those who are expressing them uh, a kind of a validity or, or rationality, right? So as if it's only neutrality, some neutral position, that we can judge what is happening, what is taking place somewhere else on, on, on the ground, like in Ukraine. It's again a kind of a protection from from the extreme. And uh, this was also very much felt uh, already eight years ago because, uh, as you of course know, the, the, the Russian-Ukrainian war started not just uh, on the 24th of February, but actually in the aftermath of the Maidan Revolution in 2014. So it was also pretty palpable and uh, one could feel it also back, uh, back in the day, in, uh, in 2014. Um, uh, and just uh, also in the context of Maidan, which, which was perhaps uh, the last uh, European revolution so far, uh, and uh, somehow presented a pretty big chance 
to the European Union uh, for any kind of uh, progressive renewal because um, um, Maidan as a revolutionary event, uh, I will also come back to that a bit later as well, uh, but it actually, uh, uh, its claim to be European and the use of the EU flag, right? Uh, and in general, so somehow the, 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 that revolutionary event in Ukraine uh, dragged Europe back to its roots, like claiming demo democracy, justice, uh, freedom, uh, really seriously. So people basically uh, were dying for that and still, uh, still are. Uh, but uh, this uh, kind of uh, European aspect of the Maidan as a social uh, uprising somehow was too much disturbing for Europe. So uh, the, the EU wasn't basically ready to accept and to incorporate those respective revolutionary outcomes which emerged after the, the uh, that square occupation experience. So uh, uh, totally not, not, not prepared. So uh, somehow Ironically, dying on the EU flag, it was too much for the EU, right? So uh, the European Union was rather much more comfortable when the EU flag has been burned down at numerous demonstrations in various uh, European capitals than when people die for the revolutionary idea <laughs> under, under the EU flag, which is also kind of an irony of, uh, of fate or of destiny. But uh, in this regard, this war um, uh, is being described in the media, but also in, 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 like in, in, in my communications with, uh, with many, many uh, institutions as well as personal colleagues uh, in, in the West in, in various ways. Like usually it's being referred to as a kind of a war in Ukraine, right? Or um, conflict in Ukraine. Um, sometimes as a Russian-Ukrainian uh, war, but I think, um, though I, I assume you, you, you are of course coming from various backgrounds, but at the same time, um, um, with regards to the Western audiences, uh, I think it's pretty often uh, people, uh, people cannot really grasp the magnitude and the scale of, of, what, is, uh, of what is happening. Uh, now, now in, in Ukraine, but basically it's not only in Ukraine. So uh, my my main point somehow uh, today is that uh, what we are dealing with is not just some uh, Ukrainian war, Russian-Ukrainian war, but uh, we have a great European war, a great uh, continental war of an unprecedented scale, uh, unseen for basically for, for decades, right? You can, you can only, only consider that uh, basically like those, those simple facts which uh, in a way depict the general uh, framework that we, are, that we found ourselves in um, because the war is basically is not only conducted in, on the Ukrainian territory, so predominantly it is, right? But at the same time, uh, other countries are directly involved. Uh, apart from Russia, of course, uh, this is Belarus, which is uh, the country which uh, has been annexed by the Russian Federation and is now under military occupation as the Ukrainian East and South. Um, but also Transistria, which is uh, occupied again by the Russian Federation, part of the Moldova Moldovan territory. But also Syria, by the way, because as we know, many Syrian merc mercenaries are also fighting on the front line from the Russian side. Uh, also, this war is being conducted in, uh, in the regions of uh, basically three seas, the Black Sea, the Baltic Sea, and the Caspian Sea. Because uh, the, the Black Sea, apart from the uh, occupied Crimea and the military, Russian military station there, including the nuclear bombs uh, that are placed there as well. Uh, this uh, Black Sea region also, of course, involves Turkey, right? Romania, uh, also Moldova, also Bulgaria. Right? With regards to the, Bla uh, to the Baltic Sea, we have this, uh, as I mentioned, Belarus, which, uh, which is under military occupation from the Russian side and uh, is uh, basically uh, directly threatened in the Baltic nation states, right? But also you, you may also, we can also consider here the uh, Scandinavian countries, right? It's not by occasion that Sweden and Finland 
already joined uh, the NATO right, alliance. Um, as for the Caspian Sea, uh, it's a typical place from which uh, uh, the Russian Federation launches uh, its um, fighter jets attack and uh, bombardments of the Ukrainian land. Uh, but at the same time, this war has already totally, really profoundly redefined the whole idea of the Eastern Europe, right? As such, like the whole region, Eastern European region, is totally different today and will be totally different uh, further on. Uh, it's basically the... the <laughs> In a way, the main question that, uh, that uh, you have to tackle nowadays, uh, which of course doesn't have any clear answer for obvious reasons, is whether this, these war developments, is it a prelude or a finale, right? And uh, this, of course, defines all the, all the analysis included, uh, including this one. Um, at the same time, uh, if we refer to the uh, realities on the, um, on the ground in, in, in Ukraine, um, it's also worth mentioning because it's uh, somehow it's such an obvious fact that I, I constantly, in a way, uh, observe the, uh, the tendency to omit it uh, uh, because it's uh, kind of a very uncomfortable uh, reality, right, that we also have to acknowledge, but we, we are not ready, really. I mean, in, in, in general, right, uh, so though it's, it's very, very obvious, but it's pretty often somehow been omitted in, uh, in different discussions uh, in the glob global public sphere, so to say, which is the very specificity of this war. Um, because unlike uh, many war conflicts of the uh, recent decades, right, uh, this war is not the war between two countries. And uh, this war is also not the war between two regular armies. And this is also not the war even uh, between uh, the army and the insurgency, right? But uh, this war is basically the war between uh, one country's military against the other country's people. Uh, and uh, this is, uh, and those, the, the, those peoples, right, in, in, a, in, in another country are being denied the right to exist as such, right, uh, from the side of the, of the Russian uh, aggressor. So, uh, in, in this sense, we, we may refer to, the war, to this war in, in, in many ways, right, because pretty often this war is being called um, the war of aggression, the war of attrition, uh, it, it's obviously, it's a total war. Uh, what uh, 80 years ago was called uh, Totaler Krieg, right? Not by occasion. Uh, indeed, great, uh, great uh, European war. And uh, at this point, I would also um, like to, to mention uh, several uh, factors which somehow enabled the, the, the very context, the conditions which, um, which in turn made uh, uh, this war possible in the, in the current form as such, right? Uh, but also these factors, I, I believe, uh, somehow defined um, in a way the optics, how the West sees this war and perceives this war, but also the very character of this, um, of this war. So I basically, I claim that uh, is basically we, we are dealing here with, um, with uh, three uh, uh, emergencies which, uh, which defined, uh, uh, defined the, uh, um, and made this war in a way possible, right, in the global context, in the global context. So the first emergency is, um, is a military one, is a military emergency. And uh, first of all here, I of course mean uh, Afghanistan, what happened uh, there last year, right? Because it was exactly this um, absolutely messy and horrible uh, US uh, withdrawal from, from Afghanistan and subsequent uh, absolutely confusing and uh, total failure, right? Uh, Western retreat accompanied with a super rapid Taliban takeover of the country. Um, which, which somehow, in a way, um, I think th th that was one of the, if not Afghanistan, we wouldn't have the war in Ukraine. That's absolutely clear, right? Because it, uh, this uh, event, um, uh, 
somehow marked the, the failure of this uh, Western idea of the so-called humanitarian militarism, right? This idea which uh, first appeared in the, uh, uh, in the context of the NATO uh, intervention in the Kosovo War in 1991, right? Then it was followed afterwards by, by military incursions into Afghanistan and Iraq by the US. And uh, actually, uh, so the, the idea that we, uh, that, uh, we can further humanitarian cause by military means, right? Mm, and uh, this withdrawal from Afghanistan actually marked the, the end, the failure of, of this idea. Uh, it's basically not by occasion that some years ago, I think it was, yeah, it was Emmanuel Macron uh, who conceptualized it very uh, precisely as a NATO brain death, right? So it was really a brain death of the Western military. And it was very well sensed by the Kremlin leader for, before conceiving this all-out war, this full-scale invasion into, uh, into uh, Ukraine. So the second aspect in this regard is, of course, uh, of course um, health, health emergency. Uh, I here mean, of course, um, uh, the, the pandemic, the, the COVID uh, pandemic which brought uh, unprecedented global isolation, right? And lack of uh, any uh, interaction or interconnection in general, really globally, right? Because it also contributed to the, um, to the state of mind in a way in the Kremlin and in general in the Russian Federation, right? Because now we, we, that's why we have lots of talks in, in the media today about uh, Kremlin's leader uh, health, conditions, right, uh, uh, because we are basically dealing with an aging uh, dictator, right, uh, and uh, who is very much, who has been very much isolated and uh, distanced from everything, from everything, right. Uh, we all remember these uh, funny settings, right, when, when he has been meeting with uh, other Western leaders, uh, these long tables and, and so on, this, uh, this is very obvious, right. And the third aspect in this regard is, of course, um, climate emergency, right, climate emergency, uh, which, uh, which has a kind of uh, two dimensions actually here, because uh, first of all, it's, uh, it's uh, really about um, um, the, the consumption of uh, fossil fuels, uh, that the EU is continuing uh, um, buying, right, uh, the, the, from the Russian side. So in that, in that sense, the EU citizens are directly financing the Russian military machine and the continuation of the war in Ukraine, right? Uh, but uh, uh, so we, I think in order to be really honest, we have to all acknowledge that, that people here are directly financing, well, somehow directly, right? The governments, of course, but it is the consumers who are financing this, uh, because that's basically the, the main uh, benefit from the Russian side, of course. Uh, so, and I wouldn't go deep into details about the weaponization of the energy crisis by the, by the Kremlin and so on, right? But at the same time, um, it's also, it has another dimension, this climate emergency, because uh, uh, from, the, from, uh, from the, like, the outside perspective, right, uh, from, uh, from the perspective of the countries who are not so much busy or obsessed with, with, climate, uh, with climate change as uh, the West is, right? Uh, is, is, there is this kind of perception that um, it's also, um, yeah, so in all these aspects, just a side note, that in all these aspects we, we are basically dealing uh, not just with a strict sense of political uh, realities, but rather psychopolitical realities, also really psychological, psychologically speaking, it's really very important to stress that, right? Uh, that, so from that kind of perspective, uh, the West is uh, constantly uh, uh, either on fire or is drowning, right? So it's like a constant emergency uh, and uh, it is uh, worsening day by day. And somehow from the outside perspective, the West has already accustomed itself to that. It, it got, got used to this uh, constant emergency. So no surprise that the, the, there would be like another emergency, right? Like, uh, like, uh, like this one. So uh, in, uh, uh, in this sense, um, 
in, 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 in this sense, these are those factors that somehow created a general context that uh, in which uh, the, even the, uh, the idea of such a full-scale uh, war uh, on the European continent became uh, somehow conceivable as such, right, uh, possible. But at the same time, um, we can refer to, um, to other aspects, right, but uh, whatever we take, it's actually uh, uh, in, in any respect, uh, this war, that's why I'm going back to, uh, to the title that I suggested, that, um, that this war is a European war, right? that uh, in, in many, many respects is just uh, a, another, uh, another proof, uh, another proof for, for that. So because, so first of all, uh, what is really, uh, I mean, it's just uh, the, the crucial point here to, not just to mention, to, but to elaborate a bit on it, uh, that we also have to remember um, uh, that uh, in a way, like uh, even those those uh, practices and those, those phenomena that we face uh, in Ukraine on the ground, right? Uh, um, somehow they they sound a bit obsolete, uh, as if they because they indeed uh, come from from the 20th century in a way, or even like the 19th uh, century, right? So in uh, so in this sense, I would say that it's really. Um, important to, uh, to, to be placed for a proper analysis and understanding uh, in, uh, in between uh, kind of uh, the notions of uh, the revolution and war, uh, right? I think that these uh, Hannah Arendt sort of say uh, notions are super important in order to understand uh, what is happening and why basically the, the, the idea of Europe or the realities of Europe are basically at stake. So first of all, um, uh, what I mean here is that uh, this war, uh, uh, it, it took uh, the form of the war, right? But in essence, in its uh, real nature, it's what we are dealing with is basically uh, what in good old times uh, was called a, a counter-revolution, right? A counter-revolution. Because, uh, so uh, we all know that how, uh, uh, how, the, how the Kremlin is like depicting uh, its purposes and its aims in, in these conditions, right? But uh, they actually can tell whatever, uh, whatever they want, but uh, it's um, the, the best way to, uh, to address this, to tackle this issue really directly without uh, camouflaging, uh, is basically to to address the very political nature of the uh, Kremlin's regime, which is, uh, par excellence, uh, counter-revolutionary, right? Uh, so uh, the uh, alpha and omega, so to say, of the uh, current degraded uh, Russian Federation regime, right, is basically uh, the idea to prevent even a precedent of overthrowing the dictator by the people, right? So this is a kind of a basic political idea which lies uh, in the foundations of this Kremlin regime for already 23 uh, three years. And that was actually the reason why, uh, why the Kremlin smashed all the op Russian opposition, right? I mean, at home. Uh, and that's, uh, that was the idea why the Russian Federation invaded Ukraine, Belarus, uh, Kazakhstan, and also Syria, of course, saving uh, Assad, right? Just not to let this precedent be uh, successful, like it was in, in uh, Ukraine. And th that's basically the reason why, uh, which, which explains this absolutely maniacal uh, obsession with Ukraine, right? From the side of the R Russian leader who is like uh, issuing articles, <laughs> long articles as a kind of a uh, pseudo-academic, right, uh, writing a lot about history, somehow uh, rationalizing this, uh, this aggression. Uh, because this obsession with Ukraine is basically, uh, uh, that's why he basically um, um, transformed the whole Russian uh, Federation into a kind of an anti-Ukraine or anti-Maidan. Yeah, because this obsession uh, is directly uh, based in the, in the fear of the revolution, right? In the fear of uh, people's uprising. And this revolutionary specter has been haunting 
the Kremlin for uh, and the current Russian leader for uh, throughout the, the his rule, right? Uh, and uh, because the, the revolution, the, the, the very idea of the revolution, right, like what happened in Belarus or what we experienced uh, uh, earlier this year in, in January, right, was a kind of a repetition of the Ukrainian invasion in Kazakhstan, um, is, is very much uh, uh, kind of the very idea is that it's the worst nightmare, right, for, for the current Kremlin, uh, for the current Kremlin regime. And, um, and it's also, uh, not by occasion, by the way, just another side note, that um, Putin also blamed Lenin in creating, uh, artificially creating Ukraine, right? That's also because it's pretty often, I have to say this, yeah, because it's pretty often in the West, uh, people think that, or try to imagine that, oh, he is somehow trying to, uh, um, uh, to, to recreate the Soviet Union or like uh, this kind of stuff, right? That, uh, um, but at the same time, let's not forget that actually the, the Kremlin ideology, uh, this Russian world, Ruskim, right, or whatever you call it, um, is, uh, has many, many problems with the Soviet legacy, however but paradoxically it may sound, right? Indeed, many problems uh, because uh, we like it or not, but the Soviet Union started with a revolutionary event, right? So the, the Putin's uh, ideology may take a lot of uh, arguments and practices from Stalin's times, from Brezhnev's times, also from Andropov's times, but never from the, from the 20s, right? From the 1920s, never from, uh, from, uh, from Lenin in this regard. Uh, so, um, in this sense, uh, mm, all, all in all, right, uh, somehow this uh, anti-counter-revolutionary nature of this regime is, um, is so much uh, put forward just because, for basically for very, very simple reason, for absolutely even primitive reason. The, uh, the, the reason is that uh, the... Um, Mm, the lack of the mechanism of the transfer of power, right? Because uh, Putin is basically facing an impossible task, how to rule forever, right? Which is not possible. So that's why nobody knows what happens afterwards, right? When a person dies, there is no mechanism what is going to be next. So, in, in a way, that's why I also talked about political realities, because it's, we are dealing again with the, an aging uh, uh, tyrant or a di a di a dictator, right? Another, uh, another aspect that I would like to, uh, to put, uh, to bring on, on, to, on the table is, um, that which, which also shows why, uh, why this, uh, this war is a European war. Uh, is because uh, this war is basically the war on memory, right? On, uh, on, on memory politics, and that's why it's very much, uh, it, at least it looks like and uh, is conducted like a reenactment of the Second World War. It's, again, not, not by occasion. Um, and uh, in this regard, I would just like to... Um, because you see, uh, uh, it also can be applied also to Europe, right? Because uh, nowadays uh, we have been all sort of obsessed with uh, this memory discourse, like memory policies and these memory studies, uh, weaponization of history uh, uh, from various sides and so on. So it's not specifically a Russian phenomenon, of course not. Um, but at the same time, let's not forget, so if you put these uh, sort of uh, problematics into a, a bigger, uh, wider con uh, context, right, um, it's um, uh, paradoxically enough, we, we have been observing this uh, during recent years, right, uh, this kind of uh, paradigmatic shift towards the, some illusionary past, right, uh, like, most an obvious uh, uh, example for that is, of course, uh, Trump's Make America Great Again, of course, right? So uh, towards some past which has never existed. So, so paradoxically, what I mean here is that this kind of memory politics has nothing to do with history, actually. 
It's not about, uh, so uh, yeah, so it, it claims history very much, but at the same time it's, uh, it's anti-historical profoundly, right? It's not about how to remember, but rather how to forget. Uh, I think it was, if I'm not mistaken, Nietzsche who put it uh, precisely that what unites us is not what we remember, but what we together decided to forget, right? So uh, in, in this memory politics, it's, uh, it's not about history, it's about kind of um, uh, thanatology, right? Uh, kind of uh, when, when dead bodies of the past become uh, uh, political weaponry, when, uh, when necropolitics rules, right? So, um, and this is also very much, uh, that's why I mentioned this, uh, connected to, uh, to, uh, to Europe, right? Because Europe is also uh, very much obsessed and uh, basically, at least it, in its uh, claims, uh, uh, very much based and related to history, right? It emerged, uh, they, uh, like the, the United Europe uh, in, in practical sense, emerged on the uh, outcomes of the Second World War, uh, right? Um, so, but at the same time, what is also surprising for a, from a Ukrainian perspective is basically that um, that uh, like it's not about Russia, but it's indeed about Europe. That uh, like a, a meta-political constellation that the basically that the EU in in political reality is right, uh, being so much obsessed with history and with uh, with the past and very much defined by the history, by its own history and the past, including the Second World War, right? But at the same time, it has always had problems with time. Uh, it's, it's really, uh, uh, you know, we were joking in uh, 2014 in the context of Maidan that while the EU was trying to take a decision, Russia took Crimea, right? So it's uh, really striking that uh, 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 Europe, that the European Union is just incapable to, uh, to act ahead. It always reacts to what has already happened, right? So it, it's just, uh, it just cannot act effectively in order to prevent something. It just reacts. So in this kind of a reactionary, again, psychopolitically speaking, uh, nature of, uh, of, of the West in general also is, is really striking. It seems like that um, uh, that the European Union cannot find proper time to react, has problems with time, with the perception of time in general, right? I think this is something uh, that it always acts in, uh, in, a prop, in an uh, inappropriate manner, right? Uh, for instance, I mean, even consider uh, this infamous Nord Stream 2 project, right? Uh, Councillor Scholz uh, wasn't able, even uh, able to pronounce, really, uh, that uh, he was going to, that he would uh, stop this project if, uh, if the war takes place, until the war did take, took pla uh, did take place, right? So the, uh, only afterwards they did. But before they were so scared that even to pronounce that, it was, uh, it was impossible. So they were like uh, this kind of really um, wasting of time, right? Because it also means uh, human lives, obviously, right? So, uh, uh, at the same time, I think that this also explains, oh, okay, uh, yeah, uh, this also explains uh, many European reactions that uh, the European Union has fetishized uh, peace as such so much that it basically repressed the realities of the war. And, uh, and again, speaking psychologically, when uh, it faced the return of the repressed, it was totally incapable to, to tackle that, right? But at the same time, um, yeah. At the same time, uh, like uh, this war, on, uh, why this war is, on, uh, is a war on memory is just, uh, for instance, consider the, the very vocabulary, the lexicon which was used by the Russian aggressor, denazification, right, uh, demilitarization, gen preventing genocide. I mean, uh, we are not really quite aware that, I mean, uh, I mean, for me, <laughs> to be honest, it's really even uh, physiologically hard to pronounce such words, right? I mean, I consider, well, I assume that in the German-speaking context, it should have been a total atrocity, but it seems that it was not, right? I mean, th that it's an atrocity talk, that it, it, it even, uh, I mean, it's a scandal itself that these words are outside in the global public sphere and everybody is using them, that they are like, like memes, like, you know. But at the same time, this, uh, this is just a total, 
right, fa discursive failure of, of the West that somehow this discourse was picked up in order to counter it, of course, but at the same time. Uh, but uh, that's why it's, uh, I think, uh, one of the reasons why it was stylized and conducted on a Second World War scale exactly uh, for, uh, for, um, for these uh, reasons. Uh, thirdly, just to be in time, I think what is really important to mention that um, this war is a colonial war. And I think that this is basically one of the main main aspects to, uh, to, uh, to, for, for, for our further discussions, because I think th this is very much connected to the European colonial and post-colonial legacy. And the paradox, because, I mean, decolonization is just a, such a fashionable trend. Uh, every, I mean, each cultural institution everywhere in the West is super busy with that, of course. We have lots of events and uh, conferences about that. But at the same time, the paradox with, about that is that uh, uh, colonialism uh, in the European context has been repressed to the past and is not being applied to the present day. So um, somehow this kind of an inability to think in colonial uh, terms uh, also with regards to other parts of Europe, like the, uh, the European East, right? Because uh, Europe's East, in terms of its colonial as well as Soviet right, legacies, uh, complicates uh, a very typical and fashionable uh, division between the global north and global south, right? Because um, Europe's east uh, has been long regarded as a kind of a semi-periphery um, within these traditional geopolitical and cultural divisions, both from the side of the western as well as Russian metropoles, right? But at the same time, it has been experiencing uh, imperial siege and occupation for, uh, for a long time, right? And it is actually the uh, living conditions under direct military occupation. That is something also which the West, the West is not capable to really to consider fully. Uh, direct military occupation, which, which distinguishes this uh, colonial background in the east of Europe from, especially the post-Soviet European East, from uh, most of other uh, uh, post-colonial contexts and, uh, and uh, experiences. Uh, take uh, Ukraine, Moldova, Belarus, Armenia, Georgia, Kazakhstan, as well as all those numerous uh, national republics currently under the Russian Federation control, right? Their anti-colonial struggles and uh, deoccupation strategies are absolutely of global importance. Uh, we are just really not fully considering that. But at the same time, let's not forget that uh, somehow in parallel, uh, the east of Europe, especially uh, the post-Soviet east and foremost Ukraine, has been also in the colonial focus of the western metropoles, Berlin in, in particular. Uh, I would not go long back to, to in history, but from the 1930s, right, when, when Ukraine became uh, both uh, a central target for both uh, Moscow and Berlin colonial, colonial strategy, up to the so-called Ostpolitik, right, in pursuit in the Cold War, uh, Cold War times, in the second part of the 20th century, uh, in, in, within the framework of which uh, Actually, Ukraine became a kind of a blind spot, an elephant in the room to avoid. And uh, the, <laughs> the funny paradox of the, uh, this so-called Ostpolitik is, uh, you know what, that is basically there is no Ost in the Ostpolitik. There is no East because it's been evaporated. There is only Moscow imperial power that uh, the West is exclusive, exclusively directing its strategies uh, to, right? And uh, this also applies to the recent history of, uh, of the region after the crash of the Soviet Union, when the EU established the so-called Eastern Partnership right, strategy uh, towards, uh, quote-unquote, uh, neighborhoods. <laughs> uh, and which also, uh, it was very uh, benefiting and comfortable for the EU in terms of uh, um, supplies of various resources, fossil fuels, first of all and also foredoomed uh, all these neighboring lands for uh, Russian imperial, uh, imperial grabs, right? And uh, so basically uh, this, uh, this colonial approach is also very much present even inside the EU. Because, uh, yeah, let's be clear here, I mean, that uh, 
we, we, it's a very typical, I mean, it's even traditional uh, colonial approach that we have, uh, I mean, we, we, if, if it's been applied to, to the European continent, we basically have two Europes, right? One is progressive, polished, very nice, uh, modernized, and there is another Europe, like second-hand Europe. Uh, barbaric Europe, under-civilized, with uh, totalitarian remains, and, and so on. So, uh, so that's uh, really pretty, uh, pretty colonial uh, background. And uh, okay, the last point I, I would uh, I would like to make here uh, is that uh, why this war is European war in this sense is because um, uh, is because this war is a genocidal fascist war. Right, and this also very much, uh, unfortunately, deals with uh, with, Europe, with Europe, with the United Europe, and uh, first of all with the uh, with the Western uh, with the Western Europe, right? Because uh, um, the problem is that basically that uh, you know that somehow what uh, what was really striking for me personally, but also politically speaking, uh, like when this war started, is this total uh, incapability to recognize Russian state fascism from the side of the West or from, from, the, from Europe's side. I think this is very much connected to inability uh, to recognize uh, Europe's own colonialism, right? Because uh, the Second World War, we call it Second World War, but with regards to the East of Europe, it was basically a German colonial war, right? I mean, let's, uh, let's be honest about that. So, uh, but this Russian state fas uh, fascism uh, was so, has been so much domesticated by the Western financial and political elites that it was somehow uncomfortable to publicly denounce it, right? And um, it was uh, because it, it, we, we, now we talk a lot about these uh, right-wing authoritarian uh, parties and uh, populists and, and so on, but it was not them. It was uh, the liberal uh, center in the West, right? The, 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 the centrists who have been pumping their assets and money into uh, the Kremlin mafia capitalism, right? And became uh, corrupted by, by it in, uh, in, in reverse. It was under the guise of liberal democracy, right? Uh, so, um, in this sense, um, uh, th th that's really uh, that's really striking because we somehow tend to uh, to, for uh, to forget uh, uh, to forget this um, because um, I think it's also very much connected to um, in in a wider con uh, in a wider context, right? Because here I am really on the pos uh, on a typical sort of say. Walter Benjamin's position that behind each uh, fascism there is a failed uh, revolution, right? And um, I think that even what, what uh, just not only Maidan, right, but what uh, took place in Belarus recently, then in Kazakhstan, and even uh, quite recently in Uzbekistan, right, uh, it also shows that we are still living in this um, revolutionary sequence which started uh, in the aftermath of the 2008 economic crisis, right? Uh, I mean, of course, the Arab, so-called Arab Spring, uh, Occupy Wall Street, uh, Indignados in Europe, uh, Syntagma Square, Tahrir, Maidan, I mean, you name it, right? But uh, all these uh, sort of uh, global wave of square occupation movements. And uh, surprisingly enough, you may take any context you like, but you clearly see that uh, this revolutionary emancipative potential um, has been effectively, unfortunately, substituted either with uh, right-wing authoritarianism or with the warfare, right? Ukraine and Syria, Libya, and so on included, right? So, uh, and uh, so it's really, I mean, that's a kind of the, this type of dialectics, right? That it's not just uh, uh, took place, it uh, did take place because something else didn't take place, right? That it was not realized because it was substituted by the, by the, by the alternative, right? So we can only judge about the, this uh, unbelievably powerful potential of those movements uh, when, we, when we observe those, uh, the harshness of, uh, these, uh, um, of, this, uh, of this substitution. So my final point here, and that's why I think it's uh, really, maybe that's why I came here in general. Um, 
that uh, I think uh, that in, in all these uh, regards, uh, what is what I, I find really uh, very very dangerous, and um, I myself don't have of course an answer to that, but. Uh, but basically, when we are trying to pose, or at least posing this question, how come that we allowed another uh, fascist war uh, possible on the European continent, right? In spite of all this, never again, and all this kitschy, right, uh, stuff. Um, uh, what is really, I mean, uh, because again, uh, we are pretty. What, what I'm describing is basically some obvious facts, right? But at the same time, I think this, uh, this. Uh, sort of clear and present danger, which is just so much in front of our eyes that we are somehow kind of blinded by that, right? That's also the, the work of ideology, right, as we know it. So what I find really super dangerous is that, um, that somehow, as we, again, this is super obvious, but somehow um, the, uh, the European countries, not only in, in the EU, but also outside, right, in general, when, uh, when uh, this war was uh, pretty like, obvious that it was, it was coming, just about to start, right? Somehow, uh, uh, all of them, all, all Europe, right, uh, in a way uh, agreed in advance and accepted that another European country can be uh, deprived of its sovereignty, of its independence, uh, freedom, all its institutions, and Europe as such would get along with that, right? I think this, um, uh, this was absolutely obvious after the, after the Maidan in 2014 when Russia occupied Crimea and uh, east of Donbass, but uh, now it's in full scale, right, this kind of uh, Chamberlain sort of uh, moment, right? I think this is really very dangerous because uh, it has in itself, it, ki it, has, it contains a kind of a dom domino effect, right? Uh, and I think this is very dangerous. We are just, I think the EU was of course not ready for the, for the outcomes of this uh, idea, of this assumption. And at the same time, uh, in the, now in the global public sphere, in all the even like progressive conferences and be uh, hiding behind this, um, uh, so to say, ivory tower of pacifism, of non-escalation, and so on, right? Uh, in its essence, basically, the idea is how to secure and ensure uh, condi the conditions in which it would be only Ukrainians, right, who are exposed to uh, shelling, to bombardments, to dying, to mass rape and killing, only Ukrainians. So to contain the war within the, the Ukrainian borders, right? Which I find, of course, absolutely disgusting and uh, obnoxious, right? So I think that Europe, in this sense, that's why the forces of cross wars, that is the kind of in the process of postponing the truth, still not capable of uh, acknowledging and accepting the uh, inevitability of what is uh, what we are collectively facing uh, these these days. So, uh, but, but of course, I mean, the, 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 the challenge is very clear that basically if we really seriously uh, think about our uh, joint future, uh, that it's absolutely clear that you, uh, you cannot trade with uh, fascism, right? You cannot uh, compromise with fascism, you cannot make concessions to Fascism. You cannot make peace with fascism because otherwise you would be swallowed. Right? So the, the only way to move forward is to fight it in order to win it over. Right? And, um, and in this sense, uh, I think that, uh, the, the, again, like revolution and war, right? why I mentioned this dichotomy is that uh, Europe or the West as such had a chance with, uh, with this uh, revolutionary wave, right? with, with the revolution as, as such to take it as a promise and a possibility for the future. Now this chance has been lost forever. It won't come again, in this form at least. So now the only possibility is to win the war. That's the only chance, right? And that's already a super grim scenario. But, uh, uh, but uh, at the same time, this challenge is perhaps the biggest uh, and the most, uh, uh, the, the hardest one of today, but it will definitely uh, shape uh, the rest of the 21st century. I put comma here, so sorry, and uh, I look forward to your questions and discussions. Thank you so much.
Okay, so, uh, thank you, Wasil, for this kind of thought-provoking, insightful uh, lecture. Um, I guess uh, maybe if there are immediate questions, otherwise I would start with a question, but if there are immediate comments or questions, we could right, go right away into the discussion and clear some. If not, maybe you have one? Sure. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I also wanted to say thank you uh, for this very thorough um, lecture. Um, there was two very interesting points that um, I never really thought about in terms of not just the Ukrainian war, but also war in general. Is this war, I think you said war of memories or war against memories, but also colonialism. And I think this war on memories, I would, I would actually argue that it's more about um, rewriting history rather than forgetting um, certain things or choosing to forget something. It's choosing what history you want to remember uh, and fighting for this. And the US is very, very good at this. This is where I come from. <laughs> they rewrite their own history in order to create an ideology um, in which uh, they're fighting for, right? And I think this is definitely something that Russia is doing in rewriting its own uh, history uh, in order to create an ideology on where uh, Ukrainians are meant to belong in Russia, so to say. But this colonialism aspect, I think, is super interesting because Europeans are... <laughs> colonialism is always pictured as if it's global south and or going uh, from Europe to North America and South America. And going east is such an interesting topic on what is colonialism and what does that really mean and how does that kind of formulate. And um, I, I don't really have a question. I just wanted to comment on that, that, that I found those two points very, very interesting and something to think about because colonialism is such a big, big topic. And a lot of people, I think a lot of scholars mistake colonialism as only Europeans going to one country, but rather it's actually expansionary ideology which goes into rewriting history yeah. as well. So I just wanted to thank you for those, those points. And if you had any further comments on it, that would be great too. Yeah. 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 Shall we collect? No. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. thank you for this. Uh, it's a wonderful uh, comment. Mm. Yeah, I totally agree. Uh, so uh, it's, you know, I think that one of the problems behind that is, uh, uh, is that um, Colonialism, uh, especially in, in, in Western Europe, right, but also elsewhere, um, has been very much, the idea of colonialism has been very much defined by the history of uh, maritime uh, empires, right? So, as, like, but also was very mu has been also very much dependent on the idea of the color or a shade of skin, right? Um, but uh, at the same time, uh, there, I there is a kind of a constant incapability to recognize uh, colonial experiences, so to say, next to your nose, right? Just because that was actually behind uh, the, uh, this, this uh, mm, actually the frustration uh, of not being able to, uh, to pursue such colonial endeavors uh, elsewhere. Of course, uh, there were some, I mean, from, from the German side, but it was exactly was, uh, that was feeding the idea of national socialism, right? To, so, and uh, it's not the same, but actually, um, w with regards to, for instance, like a, a German, German colonialism or Russian colonialism, these are continental ones, right? So they, they, they don't depend on these uh, maritime uh, travels and, uh, and uh, exploiting people of other... Uh, though in, in Russia is, of course, so many uh, peoples uh, right, who are now part of the Russian Federation. But the, uh, the problem is that, you know, it's, um, uh, it's kind of framed as... Um, conceptually framed as a kind of an internal con colonization. So first you occupy something, then you claim that it's, it's mine, it's internal. So I, I colonize myself in a way. That's the idea which was behind Nazism and, and uh, Russian expansionism uh, as well, right? So as if uh, there is no outside for these continental colonialist uh, concepts, right? There, there, uh, like uh, Putin himself once mentioned um, that, uh, uh, that Russian borders never end. They have no, no limits. Right? So it's just like constant 
uh, sort of swallowing of other, like, and grabbing other lands and so on. So this idea of no outside. And at the same time, I think, uh, you know, uh, also it's a kind of a personal, uh, personally I feel this uh, really strange because uh, pretty often, uh, Again, in the in the West uh, now, it's a major trend, and uh, all the also in the cultural field, so many institutions are pursuing that. Uh, but at the same time, what I really find uh, like a bit uh, kind of uh, what I'm puzzled with rather is that uh, somehow that um, that uh, those respective institutions or contexts are somehow so much obsessed with their own colonialism that they are just incapable to apply the same standards and the same ideas to the countries next to them even. You know, for instance, I mean, even re really very practically, pretty often, for instance, in Germany, but also it was sometimes also in Austria, but uh, uh, that, uh, for instance, when, when, uh, when a person from Ukraine, myself included, uh, are, are, is invited to take part in some discussion, it, it, it had been uh, before, especially before this full-scale war, it had been pretty often the case, right? Uh, so it's usually that oh we have to also to uh, to find uh, somebody from uh, also from Russia, right? Well, uh, the same uh, the same is uh, I, I think that my colleagues will will confirm that the same was taken uh, has been taken place with uh, with regards to the participants from Belarus, that you have to sort of to say to find another person from uh, from Russia in this case uh, just to for uh, to balance to have a balancing, right, kind of, so, so that not just one perspective dominates. Just, it would be the same as if, like, I would be sort of inviting uh, people uh, from, from Algeria to the Kyiv Biennial and also saying, oh, you know, guys, uh, I also have to invite somebody from Paris just to balance you a bit, you know. Or like uh, inviting somebody from Indonesia, saying, "No, no, it's, we should also have some 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 Dutch people as well," you know. So and the, the, it's super simple. I mean, it's like a <laughs> very practical. But at the same time, this always works. This total inability to apply the same standards that you apply to yourself just to your neighbor, right? So I think this uh, this is one of the. Uh, the reason that you, yeah, uh, thank you for that, uh, the, this uh, eastward sort of colonialism is, yeah, of course, I think th this is what has to be considered if we really aim to, um, to analyze this properly. Vasil, thank you so much for this uh, um, enlightening uh, conversation. Um, in the Western news, uh, in Europe and the States, reading newspapers, Guardian and, and New York Times, uh, Al Zaire, uh, I'm going to go to the point. Uh, Noam Chom uh, Chomsky was the biggest voice of one of the most intellectuals uh, t uh, speaking about the war. And he very much spoke about uh, uh, the cause of the, about the America, the USA, let's say not USA, uh, contemporary history and the role of the USA in this history. And uh, in all his talks, uh, he was very much accusing America of being one of the provoke, uh, one of the countries really starting uh, the war. Uh, after a uh, long time ago, uh, a lot of uh, Ukrainian uh, intellectuals, uh, I don't know if you know, like uh, uh, professors from Berkeley and MIT, whatever, they wrote an article to uh, um, a statement to Mr. Chomsky saying, Mr. Chomsky, uh, please uh, stop uh, accusing only United States about this war, but please uh, study our history a little bit better. So if you can a little bit, uh, uh, because I understand uh, all the weakness, the European community, and uh, as Anna Applebaum, the Polish uh, uh, art historian, writes, like uh, Europe is uh, as, uh, the borders of uh, Europe, they uh, lay one of the top of each other, but all these layers they don't lay nicely on the top of each other, and uh, we see the uh, last years how weak European community gets and how less opinion has. Also, we see how China is behind, you know, stays on the side of Russia, India stays on the side of Russia. Can, uh, and you talk about the Second World War, which, uh, uh, of course, was started from Europe. Can you please powerful countries like the States and China for the moment? Thank you. Yeah, thanks so much. Uh, a bunch of uh, wonderful questions. Uh, so first of all, um, yeah, <laughs> he's considering something else, and uh, there is also kind of an perversion.
first hidden admiration of Putin, right, in the West, like that they are so shocked that they are at the same time amazed, uh, which I think is just uh, funny, right? I mean, but at the same time, uh, like uh, this discourse of non-escalation, not to provoke, right, to avoid any problems, but it's a cover uh, for uh, for just a colonial approach, actually, in reality, right? Because as we know, it is. Uh, uh, as those who had been colonized, they lack agency and subjectivity, so they are not uh, supposed to, to defend themselves. It's only the uh, colonizers who have this right, the powerful who have the right to, to possess weaponry, to conduct wars, but not some minor col colonized, right? These are nothing. They, they just have to obey. Uh, so, at the same time, this is also, uh, which is very typical also, I mean, uh, it also can be applied easily to the U.S. history in terms of uh, um, black Americans movement and, and st I mean, stuff like that, LGBTQ or whatever, I mean, so uh, each, uh, whoever has an agency or subjectivity uh, has all the rights, including the, the military ones. So I think that pretty often this geopolitics and uh, uh, this kind of Chomsky-style judging about the war is just... Uh, mm, well, I think it's uh, really, I mean, sociologically speaking, I think Pierre Bourdieu would be applicable to, the, to them, right? I mean, they are thinking about their skin, how to find a safe place for their uh, worldview further on, because it has been ruined at the very end, right? It didn't work out and it doesn't work out. And, uh, and yeah, and on a personal level, I mean, how should I put it? Who do you think you are, Mr. Big Star, you know? I mean, people uh, who don't speak languages, who are totally not acquainted with the context, who have never been there, they are just uh, lecturing uh, others what is to be done, whom to join. This is ridiculous. <laughs> it's an anecdote. I don't take it seriously, of course, no. Thank you. Yeah, it's your rule, yeah, as you say, yeah. Yes, uh, yeah. Uh, Does it make sense? Yeah, 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 absolutely. Oh, 
Too much sense, yeah. Um, right, right. I just uh, came to my mind that basically the Netherlands, uh, in the context of the Second World War that you also mentioned, they, uh, the country, uh, as you know better than I do, uh, stayed neutral even 1939, after the Second World War started. So the Netherlands stayed neutral until they were occupied, right? Yeah. This is yeah, something I mean to consider also for, for today, right? I think. But um, I don't, so yeah, I, I somehow agree to, uh, with the premise of, of your question that this obsession and building on uh, the past is uh, something that emerged after the, as an outcome of the, of the Cold War, uh, in a way, because, uh, because basically, you know, I think uh, in, in this sense, um, I do believe in, uh, uh, so in this sense, also politically speaking, I am an institutionalist. So I do believe in, uh, in the need uh, of uh, the new institutions as well, as well as uh, continuation of the, of the current ones and making them uh, as much political as, um, as possible, but not just like a fashion, right? not just in a safe uh, space of a white cube uh, gallery um, uh, place. But uh, I also think that, um, you know, so in this sense, uh, I think uh, art uh, as such and art institutions in general uh, can indeed uh, contribute a lot. Um, also in, during uh, such uh, challenging, uh, under such challenging conditions, because basically, let's not forget that uh, this obsession with the past emerged uh, in, uh, again, as not uh, in the outcome of the Cold War, but at the same time, in order to, uh, it was enabled uh, by the rejection of the future as, a, as an idea, right? This even, uh, that what we discussed about this shift towards some illusionary past, is just because you, you, you cannot count on the future, right? It just doesn't make sense. Like again, uh, what uh, all these uh, square occupation movements, they in a way presented some vision for the future, right? Some utopia. And when you're obsessed with the past, you don't need utopias. It's rather dystopian, right, uh, type of thinking that uh, you, you just, uh, ba you are based on, on the politics of a kind of a ressentiment, right? Uh, which, which, uh, which is defined by regression and, and repression, right, of any emancipative uh, potential. So at the same time, I think, in, in, especially in the world in these uh, semi-peripheral semi or peripheral countries, I think uh, art field as such plays a huge role and it, it's super important to be, um, uh, to be sustained uh, and even improved in this sense because um, you know, especially when you are threatened uh, by the, uh, this uh, colonial war or on the one hand, at the same time you have uh, ma so many other threats like, like, uh, like right-wingers, right, or, or different authoritarian tendencies, also the, the vulnerability of the civic realm and in general the public sphere, right, uh, hardening of borders and so on and so forth. Uh, in, in, in such, uh, in su under such conditions, uh, pretty often, and also I'm speaking here like from the point of view of uh, my institution uh, too, um, is that uh, it's really, uh, pretty often it's even hard to find this uh, uh, proper space for an adequate political expression even in the educational field, because they are very much dependent on the uh, government uh, bureaucracy and, and so on. And on the universities, that's also somehow mirroring the, 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 the fate of, of the institutions that I'm running. But uh, so it, it's pretty often some uh, independent and autonomous art spaces that are providing that, that you, you, you basically have the possibility to do that. And this is so much valuable. It's not just, I'm not saying just for, uh, to you this, uh, just because, you know, uh, that, uh, Oh, you in the West, you have to be aware of what you already have, just evaluate that and uh, appreciate that and so on. It's just that uh, uh, the problem is that in the West, the, the art field uh, is, has been actually functioning in the way that um, even uh, very radical transgressive gestures 
uh, uh, were easily swallowed up, right, and somehow deprived of their of their radicality because they don't have any consequences in the uh, and, poli and direct political outcomes. Uh, people come and go, like see exhibitions. Right? I mean, it's just a show. Room. But at the same time, uh, but at the same time, you, you, you can have the same sort of matrix of uh, of activities, but in a bit different context. And you can see that uh, that basically, uh, um, for instance, in Ukraine, uh, the the art field is not structured the way it is uh, in, in in the West, of course, right? Because we don't have. Uh, that's why I'm speaking about institutions. So that's why I appreciate that you mentioned institutions as well. Because you basically, um, as a field, uh, as an, was supposed to be an autonomous field, right? You you don't have a kind of an, a buffer zone, a, a, an institutional skeleton which protects the art field from any kind of intervention from the outside. So you are you you are constantly exposed, whatever you do. What here would be considered as some boring liberal shit in in Ukraine would be some super radical communist stuff, you know, some radical claims. So I mean that it's just, it depends on the context, but at the same time I think that, um, uh, you know, when, it's also because it, now it's also very, what you ask is very also super important because we, we also have this trend in Poland, right, also in, for instance, in Hungary as well, when uh, art institutions have been hijacked and uh, open uh, right-wingers are being appointed as, uh, as chiefs or directors of those respective institutions. So, but uh, uh, what, uh, what I mean here is that basically when it comes to the cultural field, it's already a sign that it's uh, too late, <laughs> right? That if it already approached the, the cultural field, it means that something very progressive, emancipative and important has been missed in the political field in the general social field as such, right? And I think that pretty often in the West, uh, they, uh, they are being awakened when, uh, when it's already about themselves, right? When it just came in front of your eyes. But they are not considering these uh, like uh, signals in the dark, so to say, that, are, that they are approaching you. Because, uh, because uh, you know, I think that it's also uh, very important for the uh, Western institutions not to be afraid to, to so, so to say, to reach out to this, uh, to this outside of, of uh, which is uh, which is much more toxic, right? That much has much more difficult rules. That is not so comfortable uh, as as the, the uh, as the gallery space or some biennial pavilion and and so on, right? So. Uh, because uh, otherwise, uh, you know, at the same time, I mean, it's again like mirroring my, my personal experience uh, of the recent months. Uh, sorry, yeah, just uh, to wrap it up. Uh, of the recent months when, uh, you know, uh, I mean, institutionally speaking, we have been collaborating with so many partners and institutions uh, in the West and elsewhere, like, uh, who have always been claiming like that they are super radical, they are radical in political involvement, they, you know, this kind of radical chic, right? that they are so uh, just beyond any horizon. At the same time, when Realpolitik arrived, they just, uh, instead of this, all these claimed radicality, they simply resorted to a kind of a, uh, white cube uh, humanitarianism, helping refugees. Of course, this is super important and valuable, but at the same time, I mean, they were not even ready to disturb their publics and their authorities, perhaps they are dependent on, right? In order to, uh, to change uh, the status quo, not only in the art field, but also outside in their own respective context in order to, to, to make this war, for instance, to stop, right? So, so that's why I think that this, uh, so I am definitely for, for, for this institutional development, but at the same time, I, I think that it has to be really revised and uh, reapproached uh, accordingly. And uh, since you are from the Netherlands, I just also came to my mind that isn't it strange, right, that uh, already like for like 2015, right, that uh, this, uh, that in this war, such distant countries as Ukraine and the Netherlands have uh, uh, common victims in this war. I mean, of course, I'm H-17 flight.
this is really strange, right? But at the same time, it also shows the scale of what has been going on. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I guess, uh, thank you, Vasil. So I think it's- Yeah, 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 bless you, my, my side, yeah. I think it's, it takes your applause, thank you very much. <laughs> and I think uh, your last comment gave a, lot, gave a lot of food for thought for tomorrow's workshop, starting at 2 p.m. here at Truckle House. So I will, not, I will kind of share my thoughts tomorrow then and wishing you all a pleasant evening or a, let's say a rather a more kind of thoughtful evening after uh, this lecture and hope to see you tomorrow. Thank you for coming and also please follow the program for those who are still online with us next week where we have three events. We have a lecture with Angelo Plessas, we have a lecture intervention with Trace and with Tracy Rose. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. It was too long, so.